let me get this straight. We're getting a new dungeon and you thought I wasn't going to make even more dungeon decks? <laughs> Today we're talking about Hamapashar the Ruin Seeker because of course we have to. They announced a new dungeon, so of course we've got it. Even though the dungeon isn't technically a legal dungeon for play, I, I don't care. I'm going to build the deck anyway. So... What does Hema Pashar Ruin Seeker do? Well, room abilities of dungeons you own trigger an additional time, which is super broken with the new dungeon, because if any of those room abilities trigger even once, it's basically game over. But so unlike my Sephiroth deck, which is a reanimation deck wearing a dungeon disguise, and unlike my uh, my last deck I did, which was a Voltron deck that pretended it was a toughness deck that was actually fighting as if it was a dungeon deck. This is actually a true blue dungeon deck where the only goal is to go into the dungeon a bunch of times and as a result, harm your opponent and their ego. That's all the deck is trying to do. And so let's go ahead and quickly talk about the dungeons that the deck will be using and what they do and why. So of course, the first dungeon is Dungeon of the Mad Mage. It is the biggest of all the dungeons. At the beginning, you gain a life, then you can scry one, then you can make a treasure token or make a creature that's not, uh, not able to attack. Then you scry two, then you can exile two cards from the top of your deck to draw uh, to play them, or you can make skeletons, and then you can draw three, and then you can draw three cards, and then cast any of those three cards without paying their mana cost. This is the big boy dungeon of the set, and if we get that Mad Wizard's Lair, that is a very good ability, but it's not the dungeon we're going to be focusing on the most. The two dungeons we're going to be focusing on the most in this deck are Tomb of Annihilation and the Undercity. So the tomb says each player loses a life, then each player loses two life unless they discard a card, then each player loses two life unless they sacrifice an artifact creature or land, and then the Cradle of the Dead God, Death God will make Atropal. So this dungeon we go through once. We make Atropal, and then we hold Atropal as a blocker, and then we don't touch the dungeon again, generally speaking. The dungeon we want to focus on the most in this is going to be the Undercity. So we can search our library for basic land and then put it in our hand. Then we can scry two or put two woman counters on something. Then, you know, you can go all the way down until you hit the Throne of the Dead 3, where you reveal the top 10 cards of your library, put any creature from among them onto the battlefield with three one one counters. It gains Hexproof until your next turn, and then shuffle. This is the super busted dungeon of the set so the last dungeon you have is the lost minds of fendelver scribe one make goblins make treasures every opponent loses life and gains a life or you and then you draw a card like it's a very very simple dungeon this is like in Sephiroth, this is my primary dungeon in this deck i would probably focus on tomb and undercity but dungeon of the mad mage ain't a bad one to do as well just please recognize that as fun as the uh, the Dungeon of the Mad Mage is, it does take the longest time to get through, so be kind of careful when you select this one, as you might get stopped before you're able to complete this particular dungeon. Just kind of an important thing to note. But... With that said, the deck is going to have a heavy focus on going into the dungeon as often as possible so that it can burn our opponents, generate treasures, give us free draws, scry through our deck, uh, play free cards. We want to outvalue our opponents to the nines in this deck and then turn a board sideways at them when that board is so massive they can't do anything about it. That is going to be the goal of the deck. So, let's start out with the deck's ramp section, the way it's going to be getting to its stuff. 10-card ramp section, beginning with Core Cartographer, which can get any planes, including dual-type lands, from our deck onto the battlefield. Mirror Convert, a 2-mana mana dork. Marble Diamond and Sky Diamond, 2-mana mana rocks. Dungeon Map, a 3-mana rock that can also go into the dungeon if we need it too. Honored Heirloom, a 3-mana rock that can also exile a card from anybody's graveyard. Command Sphere, a 3-mana rock that can draw a card. Mindstone, two mana rock that can draw a card. Wayfair's Bobble, a one mana break it and then get a basic land rock. And then finally, Saravox Tome. When it comes into the battlefield, you take the initiative. You can add one mana if you don't have the initiative, two mana if you do. And then with its ability, we can pay three, exile the top of our library until we hit a non land card, cast that card without paying its mana cost. And then we lose the rest of the cards forever. But we cast that card, and we only activate that if we have completed a dungeon. So this is going to be one of our payoffs for going into the dungeon as often as we possibly can. Now, I did mention that the deck is going to get a lot of value. So, of course, we have to go into the deck's draw package because the deck needs draw outside of the dungeon itself, though the dungeon will provide lots and lots of draw for us already. Beginning with Champion of Wits. 
ETB, draw two, discard two, unless it's, you draw equal to its power and then discard two. So if it comes in with a Lord out, you draw three, discard two. If it comes in because of Eternalize, you draw four, discard two. Uh, in Moen Mystic Trickster, it's got word two and at the beginning of your end step, if, you've, uh, if you have the initiative, draw a card. And then if you've completed a dungeon, draw another card. So if you have the initiative and you've completed something already, draw two every turn. It's just a super good blue Phyrexian Arena. Dragonborn Looter, you can pay one to tap it, draw a card, discard a card. Bonded Fetch can tap to draw a card, discard a card. Merfolk Looter can draw a discard. Mazzalanti can draw a discard. And Mazzalanti can transform into the core, which lets you add tons of mana based on the number of permanents in the grave. The deck has 43 creatures, so our ability to get permanents in the grave is quite heavy. Then we have Mole Drifter, ETB, draw two cards, uh, and then of course it's got Evoke, so we can ETB and then it dies, or we can pay five and get it out as a flyer. Then we've got Spirit of Companion, ETB, draw a card, and Ever Flowing Well, ETB, mill two cards, draw two, and then if we have eight or more permanents in the grave, again, pretty easy to do with the deck, we can go ahead and flip it into the Myriad Pools, where we, in every, whenever we cast a permanent spell, we can copy another permanent. We can just turn any, uh, any permanent we have on the board into a copy of the spell that we are using and we are going to be abusing this uh, with a very particular card later in the deck so now let's talk about of course going into the dungeon how are we doing that because our room abilities of the dungeon trigger multiple times this is why Hamet Pashar is as good as she is because if we if she is our commander when we go into Tomb of Annihilation we can say hey you all burn for two now you lose four life unless you discard two cards now you lose four life unless you sacrifice an artifact creature or a land twice and then you know creating atropol you're not going to get a double effect of that that's not the worst that's not the most important effect in the deck it's just a death touch blocker that we are going to use for something later something neat and funny but outside of doing this and of course doubling up on the under city triggers like i mentioned how are we going into the dungeon that is going to be with all of these 12 dungeoning cards. Veteran Dungeoneer goes into the dungeon when it comes into the battlefield. Cloister does as well. Eccentric Apprentice goes into the dungeon when it enters the battlefield. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, if you've completed a dungeon, up to one target creature becomes a bird with base power and toughness 1-1. One, one. So if our opponent's got a big Voltroni commander, uh, we just turn it off and then punch into them anyway. Uh, Displacer Beast can flicker itself, basically, by going into your hand. But ETB, end of the dungeon. Yuletai Mel uh, Malison, if it punches a person uh and it's attacking alone it can't be blocked but if it punches a person then you go into the dungeon fade wild Care uh, caretaker gives you the initiative and then if you have the initiative at the end step create a one one blue fairy creature token dungeon delver will make room abilities trigger one additional time so if we have this out and ham it now suddenly some funny things happen so dungeon delver is out we go down into a dungeon let's say that we are going into lost minds of fen delver the value dungeon we're going to scry one then we'll make three treasure tokens then everybody burns for three and they uh we gain three then we draw three cards or under city which will make us look at the top 30 cards of our deck and play three creatures from them like just this card is a very, very strong lieutenant to our commander, and it does a lot, a lot of work. Then we have Erikoa Sneak. We get the initiative when it comes onto the battlefield. Uh, then we have Goliath Paladin. We get the initiative when it comes onto the battlefield. Nadar gives all our creatures 1-1 one, one if we've completed a dungeon. And of course, when it enters the battlefield, we venture into the dungeon. Midnight Pathfighter gives all of our legendary creatures unblock or all creatures we control are unblockable unless there is a legendary creature blocking them. And then if any of our creatures deal combat damage to a player, then we venture into the dungeon. Then Radiant Solar, anytime one of our creatures ETBs, we enter the dungeon or we can discard it to go into the dungeon and gain three life. Radiant Solar is the most busted card in the deck and it is the primary card we will be trying to copy with Myriad Pools. But... That is not everything. We want to go into the dungeon lots of times. So to facilitate that, we will also be copying our dungeon cards, beginning with Mirror Image, which, as I have always stated, if you are playing Mirror Image, please use the correct copy, this one right here, because women with white hair are one of my weaknesses, next to Paladin women and Golgari women. But 
Mirror image copies any of our creatures. Undercover operative copies any of our creatures. Body double copies any creature in the graveyard. Cephalus face taker copies any of our creatures and then gives us a 1-4 unblockable version. Clone copies any of our creatures. Mercurial pretender copies any of our creatures and it can bounce itself. Vizier can copy any of our creatures and it also has Embalm so we can drop it on the board, let it die, and then play it again as a token. And then, of course, Tomb of Horrors Adventurer gives us the initiative when it comes onto the board, and then we can copy any spell that we have. Uh, if it is, if we finish the dungeon, we copy that spell twice instead. So Tomb of Horrors Adventurer is out. We play Radiant Solar. We get three copies of Radiant Solar. Uh, and now, suddenly, anytime we play something like Eccentric Apprentice, we just finish a dungeon over and over and over. And then with Hemet Pashar, we are <laughs> generating a fark ton of value every time that happens. So just... If you're playing against this deck, don't let this card resolve. If this card has resolved, uh, recognize you've got a turn cycle before everything goes horrible for you. But what if we wanted to go into the dungeon even more often? How would you facilitate that? Well, very simple. We would use this Flicker package, beginning with Icewind Stalwart. Flicker's a creature when it comes onto the battlefield. Restoration Angel does the same thing. Scroll Shift Flicker's a creature. Uh, flickering a creature, by the way, is exiling it and then putting it back on the board immediately. So this Flicker's a creature, then draws you a card. Against all odds, Flicker's a creature, and then puts a artifact or creature with mana value three or less from a graveyard to the battlefield. Momentary Blink Flicker's a creature, uh, and then it has flashback, so we can do it twice. Semester's End Flicker's any amount of creatures we want until the end of the turn as a way to protect them from board wipes. Turn to Misk will flicker a creature. Abuelo has repeatable flickering for three mana, and the creature comes back at the end step, so we can use it to do things like protect our creatures from board wipes or removal. And then, of course, Yuri and the Sky Nomad. Uh, it flickers any amount of non-land permanents we own uh, and control, and then put those cards at the beginning of the on the battlefield at the beginning of the next end step. This is a card that has to be answered very quickly when we're playing the deck because Yurion can flicker all of our dungeon cards away, put them on the board to give us value, and then when he comes onto the board, he pulls things like Restoration Angel back onto the board, which can then throw Yurion away which will then throw our board away again. So every single turn, we get a re-triggering of all of our creatures' abilities all at once. But I also slipped an infinite combo past you in here. So let's say Radiant Solar is on the board. Anytime a non-token creature enters the battlefield, we go into the dungeon. Let's say you put Restoration Angel and Icewind Stalwart on the board through any variety of means. If these two are on the board, consider yourself having uh, consider yourself as the one who's won the game because now you can do an infinite number of this dungeon right here. Make each player lose a life, then make each player uh, lose two life unless they discard a card and then go go all the way down repeatedly. But if you don't have the life to spare for a Tomb of Annihilation kill, you can always do the softer version of it, which is the Lost Minds of Fendelver kill, which will make you generate a ton of treasure tokens, a ton of goblins. Each opponent loses one life and gains a life as you go through and you draw a card. Remember though, you can choose a new dungeon anytime you finish the previous one. So let's say that you don't have enough cards in your deck due to the amount of draw the uh, deck is doing for the Lost Minds of Fendelver to kill somebody. So you would go on the left side of this dungeon, generating your goblin token and generating your... Uh your everybody loses a life you gain a life ability do that until you are almost out of cards in your deck and then change your dungeon to the tomb of annihilation once you finish now the life you've gained from the lost minds of fendelver should give you a buffer to burn everybody to death with the tomb and because the tomb forces you to sacrifice creatures so you don't lose extra life you can sacrifice the goblin tokens that you generated with the lost minds of fendelver allowing you to do this ability until everybody is spent and you should have the ability to gain enough life to survive this particular effect on your own that is it that is one of the ways this deck can win just with an infinite combo and it's an infinite combo that it's hard for people to get very angry about because let's be honest if you lose to dungeons in an infinite way it feels really hard to be bad about that because you probably said something disparaging about dungeons at some point so the fact that somebody did an infinite dungeon run to kill you that's on you you should have stopped that <laughs> But 
we still need to make sure our opponents don't win the game ahead of us. So let's go ahead and talk quickly about our removal and interaction section. Starting with bar the gate, counter any creature or planeswalker, and then go into the dungeon. Meteor Golem, we can blow up any card on the board. Of course, our flicker abilities let us use this ability over and over again. Negate can stop any non-creature spell. Angel of the Ruins can enter the battlefield, exiling two artifacts or enchantments. And of course, this is important because the one ring is a card and you are playing a budget deck. Your deck is worth one sixth of a one ring. So play Angel of the Ruins so that their deck just stops functioning with one ring. You beat them with 30 cents. Be proud. Sorry, 14 cents. I forgot to mention the budget of the deck, by the way. Uh, $13.28. We went even lower than the usual amount. And normally, $15 deck with a commander being a dollar or less, we got to be $2 under the limit with this deck. So have fun with that. Sunblast Angel is our next card. Uh, it destroys any tapped creature on the board, like all of them at once when it comes on the board. And of course, we can flicker it. So we can have this on the board. Our opponent swings a creature into uh, swings a bunch of creatures into us to kill us, and we say, "That's funny. I'm gonna scroll shift my Sunblast Angel. All your creatures are tapped and attacking, so they auto die because this just comes back on the board, killing all your creatures." I hope you're okay with that. I hope that felt fair. Then we have the Space Marine Devastator. It's got Squad Two, blow up any one artifact or enchantment. But of course, for every two mana we sink into it, we can blow up more artifacts or enchantments because we create more tokens of the Space Marine Devastator. We are playing a pseudo flicker deck, so of course we have to have. A copy of O-Ring, exile any non-land permanent, and then because its effect is separated into two separate paragraphs, we can actually say, I cast the O-Ring targeting your thing. In response to the first trigger of the O-Ring resolving, I am going to activate a flicker spell. O-Ring is going to leave the battlefield and come back. Now the O-Ring will target a new thing, and because the second ability of O-Ring never got a chance to solidify, the O-Ring keeps the first card you targeted banished forever, because you did not get a chance for the gain state to see that second paragraph. Then you have Duplicant, exiles any creature when it comes onto the battlefield. That's the only bit of relevant text on the card. And Generous Gift can blow up any permanent and give somebody a 3-3 green elephant token in response. Play more Generous Gift. This is one of the best removal spells in all of Commander, and you should be playing it. It is ridiculously flexible. But we also need to make sure that our deck does not fall into the category of a deck that has a really flashy turn and then dies. So we have a reanimation and recursion section for the deck, beginning with Revel Arc. Anytime it leaves the battlefield, take two creature cards of power two or less and put them on the battlefield. Super cool card for our, uh, for our deck, because of course, with a bunch of our dungeon creatures having that power two or less, we can just flicker the Revel Arc, uh, causing it to get those creatures immediately. And then we get to flicker it anytime we want to get creatures back on the board. One of the creatures we want to get back on the board with Revel Arc is the Karmic Guide. Flying protection from black, and if it enters the battlefield, return any creature from our graveyard to the battlefield, and then it dies on the previous turn unless we pay its echo cost. Never pay its echo cost, it's never important. Then, Sun Titan. When it enters the battlefield or attacks, you can target a permanent from your graveyard and just play it immediately. Super, super good card. Play it in more decks. I don't care that it's in pre-cons. It's a good card. Then we have Archaeomancer. When it enters the battlefield, return an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. This is going to be any of our removal spells, any of our flicker cards. Any of that stuff is great, and because it's a ETB ability, we can flicker our cards over and over and over again to get the Archaeomancer's ability multiple times times, which can help us just close out the game very easy. But let's say you can't do an infinite dungeon run to kill somebody. Maybe you don't get the board state for that, but you do have a lot of creatures on the board because this deck has such a dense creature amount. How are you going to get those creatures into our opponent's face to kill them to death? Well, let me introduce you to two of our alternate win cons, Levitation and Wonder. Levitation gives all of our creatures flying, and Wonder gives all of our creatures flying as long as we have an island and it's in the graveyard. So, Wonder sits in grave, and until somebody Bajuka bogs us, uh, all of our creatures have flying now. All of our tokens we've generated with the dungeon, like Atropal, I told you he would come up, uh, are now giving 1-1 from something like Nadar, and we get to just ram them into our opponents repeatedly. Our goblin tokens we've spawned with the dungeon get to also do damage to people. And remember, we spawned double and triple of those tokens, so even though Atropal will kill itself, the goblin tokens will not. The skeleton tokens will not. All the tokens that our dungeon is generating, they now have flying, and they can turn into somebody's face and kill them to death. Very, very important 
get these on the board or in the graveyard close to the end of the game so nobody sees what you're going for. Make it seem like you're just an Azorius Dirtly value engine. And then, of course, Wonder touches the graveyard, and then you go, <laughs> what if all those 4-1 black skeletons I spawned became lethal damage to your face because you can't block them? This is called Breaking Parody, by the way. It's a good thing to do in Magic games. This leads us, of course, into the basic land section of the deck. We have 12 of each because the deck is evenly split. Dual lands, we have the Bicycle Land, Irrigated Farmland, Prairie Stream. Then we have Idyllic Beachfront and Glacial Floodplain. All of these are searchable with Core Cartographer. That's why they were the ones I picked. Port Town, also ETBs reveal an island or a plains, uh, so it doesn't come into play tapped. And Command Tower is a dual land just because it is our commander's colors. Uh, then our Fetching Land are all coming to play not untapped except for Myriad Landscape. The Panorama Cycle here, Esper Panorama, Bant Panorama, and then Promising Vein and Shire Terrace, they're all the same card. They get an island or a uh, planes from the deck, put it on the battlefield, or they can just be a land that we have. Late game, they're just untapped lands. Early game, they are mana fixing. Myriad Landscape is a ramp card otherwise, though. And with that all said, that is the entirety of the deck for Hama Pashar. Oh, well, there's one more card. Sorry, on to inversion. One of the lands is a board wipe. Sorry, I forgot about that. The land is a board wipe, everybody. It's a land when you need it to be in a board wipe otherwise. But let's say you wanted to take the deck a little further. What would you do? Well, the deck just wants to go into the dungeon a bunch. So as far as the copies section, I would upgrade the clones into something like Phantasmal Image and Glasspool Mimic by taking away cards like Mercurial Pretender and Clone that just are a bit overcosted for what they are doing. As for the dungeon section, we're already running everything we can be, but there is a White Plume Adventurer. We could probably put White Plume Adventurer in here as well as another way of just pushing forward into the dungeon uh, seasoned Dungeoneer, uh, Seasoned Adventurer, all those ones that go into the initiative, we could increase that amount in the deck too. Draw section, honestly, uh, is probably exactly where it needs to be for a lot of this stuff, but maybe we could take the Dragonborn Looter and swap it out for like a dig through time or something like that, or even a treasure cruise, just some other kinds of draw. But you do want to keep in cards like Muldrifter, Champion of Wits, Spirited Companion. Any of these just recurring effects are all very, very good to use. The Flying to Their Faces is just stays the same, but you could drop in a Chromos Memorial in here as well. Uh, there's Korean ones that are like $6 instead of the usual $20, so that's good. Flicker, I would add in a Conjurer's Closet, a Teleportation Circle, and a Thassa. Uh, Thassa, God of the Sea. Each of those cards will give you recurrable blinking as opposed to the one-off blinking that is in here. But I would say keep Resto Angel, keep Icewind Stalwart, and keep Yurian because of their interactions. Ramp section, obviously you can go up to Talismans and Signets when you increase the power of the ramp section. Otherwise, you don't need to do too terribly much to it. As for reanimation and recursion, the, the reanimation section's already basically where it needs to be. Removal section's basically where it needs to be. I wouldn't make too many changes to this unless you have flavor changes you want to make. So like, bar the gate I kept in because its flavor works really well with the deck. But if you wanted to push further into ETBs, uh, you could do that. And that wouldn't be a terrible idea because the deck already has so many good ETB effects. As for that basic la the land section, I'm probably going to stop giving a suggestion for the land section because the suggestion's always the same. Add more dual lands. Add more searchable lands. Add more come into play untapped lands. Like this, fairly, fairly simple. But this is probably the lowest budget deck I've managed to make on the channel so far. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. That was Hama Pashar Ruin Seeker. I had to make another dungeon deck. And I'm sorry that I put all of you through it once again. <laughs> I'll do less dungeon decks in the future, I think. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you haven't already. And as always, everyone, insert end of video tagline here. Hey, I just quickly want to give a thank you to all of my wonderful patrons who keep this show running. YouTube and Twitch are a pretty bumpy ride at the best of times, and the stability that Patreon provides me is worth more than I can say here. I'd also like to thank each and every one of my $20 and up patrons here. And they would be Red Joker, Britzkrieg, Cameron, Dren, Gemshin, Smiling DM, Poundini, Mabity Babity, Naomi, Isaac, Agamoto, Jordan, Ravi, Juni, Kiratorian, 
Prisma, all of you. Sagittarius, I'm not saying that part. And Starlight. And finally, thank you to everyone else that helps keep this channel alive. While you're here, why not check out another video? And thank you for watching.